Well, Nico's been good to Ottawa. You know, <laughs> good here. We had probably the first green Christmas I ever remember. So I'm, I'm the uh, the first of the people to repeat. So you get the second, uh, get to hear me a second time. So I'm going to start by reviewing a bit about what I talked about last time. Like last time, please interrupt me anytime you want with questions. I'll try to keep everything so that you can follow it. I hope you can. And, uh, well, let's see how it goes. So let me start out with the way I didn't start out before and say that what I'm talking about and the ideas are not only my own, but I represent a large group of people in Ottawa in the Joint Laboratory for Attosecond Science. I showed you the two labs. And I told you one was model of Buckingham Palace. And so I worked in the palace, and here we are standing in front of the Ottawa version of Buckingham Palace and the group with most people in it. It's about 30 people also, students, postdocs, and staff. Now, first thing I said last time, I think the very first few were at, I just want to reinforce it again. A short pulse is just an interference in time. It's no different than the interferences you know in space. It's just an interference in time. And for an interference in time to work well, all the frequency content of the pulse, shown here as seven, have to be phased perfectly so that each peak adds perfectly at the time it's going to add. So it's essential to be able to organize a broad bandwidth of radiation to be perfectly phased. Now, you've heard many lectures since my first lecture where I introduced or I told you this, and probably you've thought about it as you've listened, as you listened to Margaret just earlier, and as you've listened to others, and you've seen how it's done in the Atom Second Sign. But I wanted to go back to that to start out, just to make sure you remember it. Now, other things to remember. I said that to make a short pulse, we need a nonlinear process in order to legislate that all of these frequencies are phased together. If there's not a nonlinear process, each frequency evolves independently of the other. They don't speak to each other, and so there's no way to get them put phased together. So we need a nonlinear process, and I showed you what that nonlinear process was for lasers. It was really a chi 3 process, Kerr lens mode locking, or Kerr effect, a chi 3 process. And I showed you how this begins to arise in attoseconds. And you heard more from other people, including Margaret. I also talked about how it's important to measure. So to measure something, to measure a short pulse, we have to know how they're all phased together. We can't just measure independently frequencies. If we measure independently frequencies, all we know is the bandwidth. So we have to be able to link those. And that requires a nonlinear process. And in the last lecture, I talked about how these nonlinear processes can be used in autocorrelation and in fraud. I introduced both of these ideas. I didn't tell you how we make these kind of measurements in attoseconds, and nobody has brought it up yet, at least directly, so I'm going to talk about it next. Or not next, but very close to next. Okay? And then finally, I talked about how we make fast pro measurements, fast measurements, and largely that's um, and pro, and that is intrinsically nonlinear. So nonlinearity is deeply built into everything here. And in conventional femtosecond lasers, this is all chi-3, or low-order nonlinearity, and in attosecond, it's a lot, not the only, but it's a mixture of both. I showed you this figure, and I said that all of the work done uh, really up to around here in the mid-1990s was all based on chi-3 nonlinearities, learning to control these and use them well and integrate them with lasers and, of course, dispersion control, which is not shown on this. And the work that's led to the advances afterwards is all coming from this very high order, extreme nonlinear optics, and that you've heard many people's perspective on as you've heard talks over the last little bit. And I introduced some of the ideas of this extreme nonlinear optics in a very qualitative way. And I gave you an assignment. I don't know if anybody did it. 
I gave you a couple of assignments. I said start to work out some of the trajectories involved in this problem. And we spent some time talking about those trajectories. We said that an electron that ionizes in a time-dependent field, for example, there's just one cycle, and if it ionizes it relatively late in the phase of the cycle after the peak of the field, if you do F equals MA, which some of you might have done, it comes back and collides <coughs> with low energy, low energy relatively early, giving out a burst of radiation as it gives out its energy to a photon by recombining to the ground state. Or alternatively, as it induces a dipole, and the dipole oscillates because of the interference of these two. These are just two alternative perspectives on the same process. An electron born earlier will come back later, giving you higher frequency radiation. These numbers, these numbers are arbitrary here. You heard from Argus talk that it can go to a kilovolt. And the number that's born at the optimum time, just 17 degree phase after the peak, the one that's born in the optimum time comes back and collides at the zero crossing of the field or very near it, and it has the maximum energy in the problem, and you've seen this number come up periodically, 3.17 UP plus IP. That's the maximum number, and Margaret just spoke to you about how you can increase that maximum number and push it out. And we also talked about the possibility of other trajectories coming later, and there is two possible energies from each trajectory, but in a real phase mat situation, in a real laboratory, they have a different divergence, and you can set up an experiment so that these later, longer trajectories, or later, later or returning ones, can diverge, and you don't have to look at them very much. So largely, we can concentrate on these. And these are the re-collision electrons, give the radiation. This is the nonlinearity. This whole process is converting infrared photons to very high energy photons, so it's really nonlinear. It's just a funny way to look at the nonlinearity. We don't even think in photons mostly. Only here and there do you think in photons. Most of you don't. It's just a, a different way to do it. And I also gave you this quantum perspective on it. I said that what I said classically could be transferred into a quantum mechanical way of looking at it. The quantum mechanical doesn't have a real particle, of course, that really ionizes. It has a wave function, the ground state often of the atom, but it could be whatever is the ionizing this, uh, um, state of the atom or molecule or solid in that. The electron tunnels or ionizes in some way. It has to get free. Tunneling is the most beautiful way to think of it getting free. Out comes the electron by tunneling. Tunneling creates a more or less continuous wave function. Actually, you heard about how you calculate that in the talks by Lars Madsen yesterday. And he actually talked about how you find out what happens out here in the continuum and what happens inside, and you match the wave functions. So it's the beam splitter. That's what he really described. He just didn't use the word beam splitter. It's a beam splitter for the wave function of creating a wave packet plus the wave function. Okay. Two parts of the same wave function. The wave packet moves with this classical light motion. Each moment of birth, each trajectory is a portion of this wave function. And I said that you would even think about working out these classical trajectories and the classical action of the electron along these trajectories. And the sum of these trajectories is that wave packet. The final step, the electron recolliding, is the interference between the two components of the wave. <coughs> and I said, I, get, I ended up, I think that's the only thing I'll do with the review. I, maybe I have one more. I ended up with this image, which tries to make very qualitative so you can feel in your fingers why the harmonics are emitted, why they have a clear phase, why they work so well. So here you see what was an initial wave packet, wave function, sorry, that was Gaussian in this image. So you know what a Gaussian looks like. Here you see an image of a recollision white electron coming back from the left, from left to right. I gotta make sure I get it from your son. Coming back from the left and the right, it's shown as a plane wave coming in. Of course it's coming in like this. And 
Here is the sum of these two, because the wave function is the sum of the two components of the wave function, the original one plus the wave packet in the continuum. But of course, the probability of finding the electron is given by the wave function squared. So here's the square. When you square it, these bumps that stick up in the wave function are more prominent because of the squaring. So this is just the squaring of that. And then this is the dipole. This is just projecting it onto the dipole. Where's the charge? Is it to one side or the other? Here's the dipole. And that's the dipole at this moment, or this overlap between the wave function and the wave packet. The wave function and the wave packet. But the wave packet is moving very rapidly. And so very rapidly, this is the interference pattern. Now you know how to look at it. The wave, uh, the dipole has moved to the other side. And as this wave packet pro propagates through the wave function, there's an oscillating dipole. The oscillating dipole emits radiation. In fact, if you were to look at the wave packet coming back, that's the F equals MA calculation, you would find that the frequency of this, the frequency, which is the momentum, is increasing with time, and that's the chirp that I showed you from a classical perspective earlier. So you can see everything here. And you can see why the amplitude and the phase of the emission is so coherent and so beautiful at the single atom level. And in the mobile level, level you just heard about in the last talk again. You heard about from Ken Schaefer yesterday. You can represent that dipole here. You might want to just look at it for a moment. The dipole is given by the wave function times the recolliding times r times the wave packet coming back. If we think of it as a plane wave, it's got some amplitude at momentum k. It's got a wet e to the i kx, e to the i <coughs> omega t. And to a large extent, our measurement of the harmonics, which is measuring the dipole acceleration, of course, which we're, we're, we're looking at with the harmonics, is really a measurement of this process in which we know omega, because we're measuring omega. Maybe we can assume omega relates to k. So in some ways, we know k. And so, in some ways, our emission is a measurement of this, where the unknown might be the wave function. I just put that in as a teaser for you, because I'm going to come back to that tomorrow. And maybe I'll even come back to it at the end of the day. Then I, I finished up, I guess I remember this, I finished up with measurement. And I'm only going to show you on a core. Just to remind you of how measurement is done with visible pulses, not with that second. With visible and near visible pulses, the pulse that you wish to measure is be brought in to a beam splitter of some sort. Let's assume it's a perfect beam splitter, so what comes out this way and what comes out this way are perfect replicas. If they aren't, we would set it up so that they were. So they went through the same amount of material. So you can make it so they're perfect replicas. One beam goes through a delay line, another beam comes through, avoids the delay line. And so now by moving the length of the delay line, we can move the relative timing between one replica and the other. And now overall, we find a way to make the pulse measure itself, make one replica measure the other replica. Here is shown autocorrelation, which is the simplest and maybe not the most, but not the best of the methods for measuring the duration of pulses. In autocorrelation, you can imagine a pulse comes into a second harmonic crystal. It will possibly make its own second harmonic, but it will go off in the direction of the laser radiation from momentum conservation. The other pulse will come in in its other direction, creating perhaps its own second harmonic going off in another direction. But if the two pulses are simultaneously overlapped in the crystal at its appropriately phase match, it's possible that you take one photon from one pulse and one photon from another, creating a second harmonic consisting of one and the other beam. Of course, it goes to the bisecting angle from conservation of momentum. It goes to the bisecting angle, and we can look at that and measure the degree of overlap between the two pulses. And that's what's measured in 
of the correlation. I showed you the functional form of it. And I said, work out what the width is for a Gaussian impulse. I'm not sure if you did or not, but uh, if I gave you a different shape, you would have got a different width, and that's the trouble with it. It's good, but it's not perfect. It's OK. And I talked about other techniques, but I won't go into them. So now I want to go into something new. And this was only the review, just to remind you of what I said last time. And some of them were reinforced by others, although I took a much more laser perspective in my first, my first talk, because I wanted to give you the background. So now uh, I want to go to measuring attosecond pulses. How do we measure an attosecond pulse? If you go back to this, it looks kind of discouraging. You can say, I'd like to do the same thing, but you know, where are you ever going to get a beam splitter for an attosecond pulse? It's got a huge bandwidth, as you know. So what could possibly be a beam splitter? It just it seems hopeless. I think it is hopeless. It seems hopeless anyway. And uh, well, you bring the beams around. Let's imagine it wasn't hopeless. If you could find a way to do all of this, what are you ever going to get for your nonlinear medium for an out of second pulse? We heard Lindy Young talk about how X-rays are just don't do much nonlinear at all yesterday. So um, we're not going to very easily find a nonlinear medium here, at least. We'd have to look hard. And when we understood, it would even be harder, I'm sure. So it seems hopeless. So what we do is the standard way, the gold standard, I said, is the add a second street camera. So the add a second street camera is rather a simple idea. In some ways, it's a retro idea. It's what we did in laser physics, almost in the first days of lasers, when we didn't know better ways. And the idea was you bring the laser beam in to be measured. You photoionize something with it. In the early days of lasers, you came into a photocathode and made electrons in a photocathode and sort of hoped that these electrons were a replica of the pulse that came in. And then you tried to measure this replica pulse in a street camera. I'll show you an image of what the street camera looks like in just a moment. But, um, well, photocathodes are a problem, but maybe they're not a problem because atoms could be a reasonable photocathode. If you think about something like a hydrogen atom, let's say, a hydrogen atom, when you photoionize an electron by, by the electron, you create a replica electron wave packet in the continuum of the, pre, the, the pulse you came in, came in with. In fact, it's almost the inverse of what I just said before about making the add a second pulse. So photoionization creates a replica photoelectron to the pulse that you wish to measure. It's a replica in amplitude, although it's interpreted through the transition moment, but for simple systems we would understand it. It's interpreted through the transition moment. And it's a replica in phase, again, interpreted through the transition moment. So as long as you don't have a transition moment, the photoelectron wave packet that you create is a replica of the attosecond pulse that you brought in. Or the pulse, it doesn't have to be an attosecond pulse. And so the trick is to try to measure this photoelectron replica instead of the attosecond pulse itself. OK? Just to make sure it's clear, here's an image. I took it from. Uh, uh, an image from um, Terence Krauss of how a street camera works, and I'll just take tell you where, where the changes are. We brought, you would have brought a pulse in to be measured to a photocathode. We're going to replace the photocathode with just a gas of atoms. But that doesn't make much difference. We make photoelectrons. In the photo, in the street camera case, we would have got those photoelectrons and pull them as fast as we could away so they don't diffuse and so they don't get all mixed up, right? Because they disperse like mad. Uh, we would have pulled them as fast as we could in between deflection plates. And then the first electrons would see a rising voltage and get deflected more and more and more and more the later and later they came in, or depending on which way the field is going. And you could see the, in space, a replica of what you had in time up here, if you did it well. But how fast can you turn on the voltage in the deflection plates? Not so fast. And how it's tough to get these electrons in, especially if they're at a second electrons with a huge spectrum, with them not dispersing and be 
becoming and losing your information. So instead of doing that, we say, let's take an atomic gas, let's put it right between the deflection plates, but let's get rid of the deflection plates, so I don't even mean to put it. Let's use a laser beam, which is a time-dependent uh, time electric field, so just something like a sweeping field that you put in the deflection plates can be placed by a laser beam itself. So use a laser beam instead of the deflection plates. Put the atoms right there in the middle of the laser beam, create the electrons so that they immediately see the field. And then, well, so replace the photograph with that, I'm going through these, I should go back. Replace the time of the varying electric field with an infrared laser beam. The beam you use to create the attosecond pulses are just fine and is used by almost everybody. And measure the energy of the electrons instead of the displacement, but it's the same idea. Right? You know, measure the lateral energy instead of the displacement. So that's the idea of the attosecond street camera. It's a conventional street camera concept moved into the attosecond. And it works very well. Just make sure that you understand now how it works, and I'll take two images, just simple images, to re reinforce this before I go through. An atom photoionizes, creating a photoelectron replica. These electrons from photoionization will, can be going in any direction they wish, consistent with the transition moment that created them. So I will assume that they're going in any direction, but of course this could be modulated by a directional component of the transition moment. I'll represent them by their velocity. Their velocity is given by the photon energy minus IP. In this case, the it's a range of photon energies minus IP. So you might say I should represent this by a wide distribution, but that gets kind of awkward. I'll show you the experimental results and you'll see the wide distribution in a minute. Okay? So now, this is the initial photoelectron distribution that you may represent it this way. Now let's do the same thing, but create the electrons in the presence of an infrared field. We might create it when the infrared field is peaked. If we do that, and you follow F equals MA, just integrate it like I asked you to do yesterday, you will find that the photoelectron distribution is unaffected if it's created right at the peak of the field, and so I represent it there by the same circle we had before, one with that. That is, if you integrate out to the end of the pulse, for a pulse that integrates to zero from the peak of the field, it will come back to where the same velocity that it was created with. However, if you create the photoelectrons at different phases, let's say at the zero crossing, they're moved off to the left or off to the right, depending on which way the field was pushing these photoelectrons and then you integrate to the rest of the pulse. Okay. So uh, I just happen to know I don't have to integrate to the rest of the pulse. I know when it's made at the peak of the field. But if you want to prove it to yourself, take some short pulse. Make sure the field integrates to zero, so it's a realistic short pulse, one that can be radiated, created at the peak of the field, integrated out to the end, and you find out what I said. So it could be a assignment again. I didn't make it up as an assignment. I have something different to get with this. So you can calculate what happens to the velocity of these electrons, and as you can see from the image, it depends on the direction you look. So we're going to want to look at some particular direction and we're going to watch the what happens as we create and uh, put it at a second pulse. Now let's imagine the at a second pulse itself. It has some duration, so some part will be created here, some part could be created there, not only at the peak of the field. So this distribution, which is shown in black, will be spread out a bit. On the other hand, if I got the phase differently, it'll be moved out here and it'll be moved around depending on this range of times that the electron is released and its integration to the end. And so this gives us, well, I think the next few graph is an image. This gives us 2D information. So here is a setup. A beam is brought in, taken in to create an isolated at a second pulse in the jet. We select off a piece of the beam, bring it over to drive the street camera. 
So we just bring it around, stabilize it, to make sure it, it's stable. And then we bring the beam to be measured, focus it into a second jet. This could be our hydrogen jet, it's not hydrogen. In our case, it's helium. But hydrogen's hard to deal with. But in principle, it could be a hydrogen jet. And here you create the photoelectrons. You look in one direction, you catch these photoelectrons, and you measure their spectrum, spectrum here, as a function of time delay. So you see the oscillation up and down, up and down, up and down of the distribution. You see a brightening and darkening of the distribution. And this has all to do with how this distribution of photoelectrons released in energy and time are created. So as I said, you can go back with F equals MA and you can calculate almost everything here. I, I have a view graph, but I didn't put it here, where I have a comparison of a calculation made based with F equals MA and a calculation done with the strong field approximation quantum mechanically. And you can almost not tell the difference. So this is now gives us information. Actually, since you remember what I said about frog, and I said about autocorrelation, let me go back and remind you. Autocorrelation gives you one number, the energy of the second harmonic pulse, as a function of delay between the two pulses, one and its replica. And then I said, but there's a theorem that says that it's impossible to reconstruct uniquely the pulse duration from 1D information. You really need 2D information to reconstruct the pulse duration and frog was a generalization of autocorrelation to look at the spectrum. So here, we equally have a two-dimensional information. We have energy and delay. It's like spectrum and delay. So we have almost frog-like information. In fact, we can do a frog -like reconstruction or something very similar. OK, so that's the idea of at-a-second measurement. I'm going to show you an at-a-second pulse, and I'll come back to at-a-second measurement, because I'll show you the slide in a minute. But I wanted the concept to be clear. So, anybody with questions? Yes, please. Uh, is the assumption here that the at a second part is weak compared to the iterative parts? Um, so you can do F equals an A with the only iterative part? I think that, yeah, this, this base, I suppose it is in a sense. They always are weak in a sense. You're struggling always for photons because cross sections are relatively small and beams, yeah, I, I guess it is. Um, it probably would be hard to get a realistic case for it would not be. Yeah. I am uh, I'm sure it is. It's so so much so I didn't think about it very carefully before. That's why I'm stopping and hesitating a bit. Yes, I think. Which uh, pulse does the photoionizing? Is it the tie staff or the Oh no no no, it's the at a second pulse that's photoionizing. The tie staff has to be there only to accelerate the electrons but not mm -hmm. photoionize or not photoionize in any way that you cannot distinguish. If it does photoionization, you want its energy, the electron's energy to be out there, distinguishable clearly from the ones I release, the photoelectrons I release, and I push. So the at a second pulse is making a photoelectron replica, and that replica is being measured by this frog, by this gate, which is the infrared pulse that's manipulating these photoelectrons. So the measurements are, as, are um, seem to be extremely accurate. There really is no obvious limit to how short a pulse you can measure, although it's photoelectron spectroscopy is always hard. You're always measuring only one or two or three or four electrons at once, and so they're always difficult to do. And cross sections of set a week and photon at a second pulses, although great are could be stronger. So there are limits in practice, but in principle, I think this is solved the measurement technique. There are other ways that I would want to introduce them in this course. Any other questions? Yes, please. What's the unit of the delay? Excuse me? The unit. I still didn't understand. The unit. Unit. Oh, the units here. Sorry, I'll, gi I'll give you real units in a minute. But this is being modulated by the infrared laser, so 800 nanometers in this case. <coughs> so I'll give you one with real units. This is just an illustration right now. So this is an 800 nanometer periodicity. And so you're pushing it, or pushing it this way, pushing it, pushing it this way. So it's one period of the 800 nanometer light. 
And this depends on what the, this is the spectrum of the pulse as seen through photoionization. So in other words, I've got the IP of energy in the radiation, phase changes, there are all kinds of things to do. But every experiment otherwise is the same. OK, so um, now I've given you some idea how to measure the short pulse. In attoseconds, the details will be very different, but the concepts remain the same. We have to link the frequencies. We have to find a way. I want to end up this part, and then just for the last part of my talk, I want to make the jump towards the basic ideas in the strong field, uh, strong field um, processes. So in order to make a short pulse, somehow we must lock the phases. So we need three things. We need many frequencies, a large bandwidth. We need a spectral bandwidth that's big. Um, we need each phase or each frequency locked to the others, kept in phase with the others. Um, and we not, must not only get them in phase, but as they work, what propagate around in the cavity, we must keep them in phase. This is a modern uh, femtosecond laser which can go down to about a cycle or a few cycles if it's carefully designed. And it has very few elements in it. It has mirrors that are always essential for the laser. It has a gain medium. Thai sapphire is frequently used because of its very large bandwidth, satisfying the many frequency criteria. It has a nonlinear element, although it's not obvious. The nonlinear element is actually Thai sapphire itself. I'll explain to you in a minute. And it has a set of prisms along the pathway, and those prisms are there for dispersion compensation. And so I'll describe that to you as well. And these are the two critical elements in a modern laser a nonlinear element, which is the material itself in many cases, and some method for phase or dispersion control which in this case is two prisms. <clears throat> so let's deal with the issue of dispersion control first. We've already discussed this a little bit. If we have a very short pulse by hypothesis, and we bring it into a material, just low intensity, ordinary propagation through any material, every material has a refractive index as a function of frequency, except the vacuum. And so every material will disperse the pulse. The pulse that comes in, that could be transform limited, comes out with a chirp in it. You recognize that. We described it before, a chirp pulse. And in fact, the chirp pulse will look very much like this, with the red in the front and the blue in the back. For most materials, this is normal dispersion. So when you make an oscillator, with two mirrors, and you think of the frequencies that can sit there that will add to give you together to give you the short pulse. A real, real oscillator has frequency-dependent mode spacing because the dispersion of the material makes the material effectively a different length for each frequency. It's exactly like a real molecule versus a harmonic oscillator. In a harmonic oscillator, the levels are separated by an equal spacing each level one from another. In a real molecule, you have a uh, non-harmonic potential, and the vibrational modes are separated by something that are not equally spaced. If you create a wave packet in the molecule, it only moves a couple of times until it disperses, and it's almost unrecognizable after a few oscillations. Um, if you create a wave packet in, the, uh, in an oscillator, a short pulse, if you don't do something, it will also spread out in phase and become unrecognizable over time. So in order to uh, overcome this, we need some sort of dispersion compensation. So it turns out that the refractive index has two effects, of course. The refractive index, as we all know, creates light that separates in a prism. That's in fact the dispersion of the material that the refractive index is different for each color. And of course, it has the effect of giving us a chirp pulse as well, one in time and one in space. And so, although it took 20 years in order to discover this from the beginning of mode locking 
and people worried about how to get around the problems of pulse dispersion, it turns out it's quite straightforward. You try to get dispersion in space to compensate for dispersion in time. Let me just show you how this works. Let's assume we have a short chirped pulse coming into the material. The different colors, when they come into a prism, are dispersed differently. The light goes through a different path, depending on its color. And when it comes up to a second prism, correspondingly positioned, as shown here, the light will compensate and go back parallel to itself. But you will find, if you come out here to a wavefront, and you trace the path length, the path length in space, and the path length through the material, the effective path length, you will find that the different colors have gone through a different path length. And so you can have one color catch up to the other. In fact, it's like it's, it works very well, so you get normal dispersion, and by putting in a prism compens with hair, you can compensate for normal dispersion. The blue will catch up to the red. However, they're offset, as shown here. The blue now is offset to one side, the red to the other side. If you put a mirror and bounce it back on itself, it undoes itself in space, but the path lengths remain equally or doubly different. And so you can have now the blue catch up to the red without the spatial consequences that seem so devastating when you think of a prism in the first place. All beams, all colors are still going parallel. They're going parallel in the opposite direction. And depending now on how much material you put in, move this back and forth, this has normal dispersion and this has anomalous dispersion. You can compensate and make the balance, so normal and anomalous dispersion, equal each other. And that's what's done in many modern <coughs> femtosecond lasers. And that's the reason for the prisms. Now the second thing I want to talk about is how are the phases locked? How are the phases locked together? This is done by Kerr lens mode locking, the Chi-3 the, uh, process, the nonlinear process, I talked about in the first place. All, all frequencies approximately the same thing. But it's easy to see this qualitatively if you think about it. Imagine you have a low intensity <coughs> pulse coming into a piece of material. Any piece of material will be fine. In practice, it will be the Thai sapphire crystal that will be the lacing material that is the nonlinear material as well. If it's low intensity light and the sides are parallel, it's just a block of glass or a block of material, nothing happens to it. However, if it's high intensity light, the refractive index, the refractive index depends on the intensity in this form, um, n sub zero and n two i, where i is the intensity. And the intensity has a spatial property to it. The intensity is a Gaussian beam or something like a Gaussian beam in all cases. It doesn't go on forever. And so the light that propagates in this case will have its phase delayed because of this extra refractive index relative to what's out at the edges where the intensities are low. And so the beam will naturally be focused as it propagates through. This is light cell focusing. It's really the same idea as in cell focusing. In fact, its frequency content will also be increased. But it's sufficient here to think of only the spatial properties of it. So a real pulse, which has low intensity at the front, high intensity in the middle, and low intensity back here, goes through unaffected, unaffected, focused. Right? So that's what happens, and that happens inside the laser. Here's an illustration of that process. Here's the pulse coming in. It comes into the nonlinear crystal here, through a lens or through mirrors, but through a nonlinear crystals. The part that's best focused is comes out, and you just set up the second lens, so that's the one that couples back into the cavity best. And all of the low intensity stuff doesn't couple nearly so well into the cavity. Now you favor, the cavity favors the high intensity part, or the part right in the center, and it suppresses the stuff out in the edge is the low intensity pulse, squeezing on the pulse. Every round trip in this cavity, the pulse is squeezed shorter and shorter and shorter, 
until it can be squeezed no more. And so that's what it looks like. That's a, uh, a relatively modern femtosecond laser. It has almost no components, mirrors. These are just mirrors to concentrate on the nonlinear crystal, so just a four, set of four mirrors. A tie sapphire material for lasing. <coughs> the beam set up optimally for self phase modulation here, linking all frequencies in the cavity by this squeezing that I described to you before, and then its dispersion is controlled by a prism sequence. In some lasers, you will see the prism sequence removed, and you can put chirped mirrors in all places where you have mirrors to replace the prisms. Uh, those are sometimes better because there's nothing to move, but sometimes they're worse because there's nothing to move. So it depends on your perspective. If you don't want to touch anything, get your mirrors. If you want to be able to optimize, then uh, play with prisms. So there's the, uh, there's the pulse I showed you before, and that's made by a system just like this. Okay, so now I've covered, I hope, the in, the how, short, how you describe short pulses, the technology for measurement, and the technology for making them. I won't talk about amplification, that's also important, but this would be only amp, this would only be lasers then. I want to use the last, I have about 10 minutes left, my last 10 minutes, to make the jump towards the physics of atmosphere. <coughs> So the next thing is the other kind of nonlinear optics, extreme nonlinear optics. That's what allowed this jump in pulse duration, this changing in the slope, and allows the advances that have taken us to add. To me, in some ways, this all starts out 50 years ago. 50 years ago, Keldish, writing in the uh, Soviet literature in 1964, so it was 1964, wrote a paper which he called the ionization in the field of a strong electromagnetic wave. Uh, in this paper, he described placing an atom or a solid, he did both, they were simultaneously treated inside. In the case of a solid, you can think about a band-to-band -band transition. In the case of an atom, you think of ionization. So ionization is what was termed by the deal deals with solids as well. And in this paper, he said, if I were to think about using infrared, strong electromagnetic infrared pulses, long wavelength, well, he actually does with many pulses, with many frequencies, but infrared is the most interesting here. If I think about interacting with infrared pulses, if I satisfy the criteria shown here, gamma squared, where this is now called the Keldish parameter for him, um, where uh, gamma squared is given by IP, IP being the ionization potential, or the band <coughs> gap, whichever you wish, over 2 UP, where UP is the energy of an electron oscillating in an electromagnetic wave, just a free electron, otherwise at rest, just oscillating back and forth, and this is the average energy of this, called the ponder motive energy. So over 2 UP, if this is satisfied, then you can think about the removal of the electron from the atom as tunneling. So this is an amazing idea. It's, not, it's obviously not tunneling. Tunneling is a DC effect. You place an atom in a field that everybody studied in the 1930s. We, people discovered that you could tunnel electrons from atoms below their barrier, and the electron just appears in the continuum. So he said exactly the same mathematics applies. You can think about this almost as if the field were static, even though the laser field has, can be quite high frequency and still satisfy this condition. To give you some idea, UP um, is the classical motion of electron. It's about 6 eV for 800 nanometer light and an intensity of 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. You can scale everything else from there because there's the formula. And if you want to think about a solid, if you want to think UP is 2.3 EVs for 3 micron light and for 2 times 10 to the 12 watts per square centimeter, 
And I almost certainly thought of that as a, a free electron mass that is a fraction of the free electron real mass. I think, um, maybe I'm not. I have to work that out and check. You might want to check it. In solids, the electron or the effective mass is much lower. And I may or may not have put this in. This has been a, a highly influential paper. To me, it's really important because it's just amazing. He made this statement that an electron tunneling out of the system and into the continuum is this beautiful process. It looks like a beam splitter, if you would. It's amazing that a static field theory describes something that happens in the time scale of the laser pulse changing the field and the window open for tunneling inside, say, an 800 nanometer laser pulse can easily be only around a few hundred attoseconds. So ama amazing again that a static field could, a static theory could describe this. So thus in 1964 it made the first step towards attosecond science, I think. And even inside, hidden inside his paper is the second step. He never commented on it, I don't know how much he, how much he thought about it. And the second step was to say, what happens to the electron after it's created? I won't go through these equations. They're relatively straightforward. They're just equal F equals ma. If you think about the field, the laser field, E, as cosine omega t field, and we think about the electron as tunneling out, being created by tunneling out, let's imagine it tunnels out at some time, and we can associate the time. Then we can solve F equals ma, and we can calculate the characteristics of the electron born at any given time as a result. And this is such a calculation. And you find out the velocity of the electron as a function of time is equal to an oscillating term, electron oscillating in the field, plus a term that depends on its time of ionization, its time of birth. That's T prime in here. This is the beginnings of the ideas of a trajectory. An electron comes out, if the electron comes out, you can follow what it did, it was born at time t prime, all its characteristics by classical physics. <coughs> um, so I just told you how to do that. I, won't, I didn't go through the calculation because I don't think you need to see equal f equals ma, nor do I have the time to do it. But just to, just to make it clear, the electron is born somewhere. There it is. D equals zero. T equals some time. Calculate from then on for all different phases of birth. What is the characteristic? And you'll find out an awful lot about what we will see in that second science. Actually, if you do that, do the same thing for circularly polarized light. An atom, go on potential in a field. The electron is born at some time, the field pointing in some direction. Calculate what happens to that electron in circularly polarized light. Change the phase, look at all possible phases. You'll see it's extremely different, linear versus circular. Very different behavior, very different results of the calculation. And when you're done, you will understand a lot about trajectories, and you will understand the essence of the atom clock that many people talk about. So anybody wants to know about the atom clock, I wasn't going to talk about it, and I doubt anybody else here will. Come and find me, and uh, well, work this out. This is all kind of interesting to do. It's freshman physics. It won't take you very long, and it will give you a feeling in your fingers for an awful lot of Edison science. OK, so what Caldish didn't understand, uh, what he didn't recognize, is the next step. So here is the, this classical light view of an atom. I told you that a moment of birth maps by f equals ma to a trajectory of the electron. You can calculate what time or under what circumstances that the electron might be driven back and collide with the ion from which it went. Let me just make it clear that it could easily happen. Field is pointing, say, that direction, or force in the electron is that direction, not to worry about the charge. The electron is pulled away, the field changes its direction, the electron is driven back, collides, recombines. Okay? It turns out that for fields, more or less, any time after the peak of the field and for the next quarter of the cycle, 
will be driven away and it has a chance to come back and collide. And when it comes back and collides, it can recombine. It turns out that for an electron born late in the field, it will come back earlier with low energy, <coughs> recombining, giving out its energy as a low frequency photon. If it's born a little earlier, it comes back, giving out more energy as a higher frequency photon. And finally, there's an optimum time of birth in which it comes back and gives out the highest frequency photon in the problem. And that gives you the Addis. This is the essence of the Addis second also. Okay, so first thing you see, you see a large bandwidth given by F equals MA. You see a chirp on the pulse, just like we described before. It's a red chirp, or it's a blue chirp, right? It's going from red to blue. Uh, you will see, if you do F equals MA, that the frequency of the electron coming back depends on the wavelength of the light that's driving this. The ionization potential of the atom, but then we need the tunneling. Uh, depends on the field at which the electron is born and things like that. But this can easily go up to kilovolt. Not easily, but it can go to kilovolt under some circumstances. And so the bandwidth can be huge and it's frequency coded or chirped pulse, just like we described before. Okay, so <clears throat> just to make sure that, yes, please. Uh, how do I see that? Uh, with many atoms, this process will give you give me a coherent light. Ah, yeah. Okay. So uh, let me. I, I was going to do with that. Can I wait just two or three slides? I'll just comment it. I'll, I'll but I'll spend some time on it as much as you wish. But if you don't mind, two or three slides later. Um, I know you all study quantum mechanics, so I can't just leave classical physics in the middle. And I'm almost done. <coughs> I know I'm almost done. So I want to make sure right away that you make the transition from classical physics and from classical trajectories to quantum trajectories. So here is a quantum mechanical illustration, like you, a quantum mechanical picture, if you wish, of how that process works. You have an electron, bound electron now, a wave function. The electron splits, creating an electron left in the ground state, plus an electron wave packet in the continuum. That tunneling is fine. Kelly's dealt with tunneling. That's a quantum mechanical effect intrinsically. The electron, of course, is phase related because it tunnels from the ground state out to the continuum. The wave packet propagates. That I really need a movie to show, so I'll have to illustrate it. And some portions of that wave packet, the wave packet gets pulled apart and changed. And some portions of that wave packet are driven back to overlap the wave function from which it left creating, finally, an interference or a dipole in the atom <coughs> as well as interference coming back. So a quantum perspective is a bit like an interferometer, an electron being driven out, driven back again. Classical physics gives you the trajectories. You can make it semi-classical physics and get the electron phase along the trajectory. And the sum of all trajectories, all moments of birth, give you the wave packet that I've described to you in quantum mechanical language. So this is a wave packet, which is a bit like a shear interferometer. So which that the fraction of the electron gets scattered at DBT? Excuse me? Which fraction of the electron gets scattered in typical experiments? Generally, we don't tunnel, we don't, you need something back here, right? There's no, right. Oh, it's clear you need something back here. You can't go back to an empty state. Right. This is like any nonlinear process. You go back to the state from which you left, right. and you left lots of population. 10%, 5%, something like that, small portions. Depends on the experiment. Right. Um, but you don't, you don't generally do too much. Um, okay, so that's, I just want to do the, the last thing. I just want to give you a qualitative picture for this interference or this final step. And so you understand the whole ideas of the, co inter the coherence. So this is taking and isolating that overlap. Let me just make sure you understand what I'm talking about. Here is the overlap between the wave function and the wave packet. I'm only going to concentrate on that part. The wave packet is going to go across this thing and it's going to do its, and it's going to, I'm just going to take a moment in that interference. There it is. 
And now I've got it coming back again. And you can see the superposition. I do all the two wave functions in this case. A Gaussian plus, plus a equation, plane wave. And there's the sum of the two here. And there's the, uh, the, the sum of the two. And well, that's the sum of the two. This is the square to give you the probability. And that's the dipole, therefore, induced. And as the wave packet moves, in this case going in this direction, the interference changes. The square is there, the dipole is there, and so you can see the dipole oscillation. The dipole first was there, now it's here as the interference evolves. It moves back and forth. An oscillating dipole emits radiation. The radiation that's emitted is the radiation that you see. This is the attosecond or high harmonic pulse, the XUV radiation. That's interesting. This is the dipole, the strength of the dipole that's induced in a plane wave approximation. <clears throat> and the dipole that's induced is the transition moment, or essentially the transition moment. So the electron recombines or induces a dipole in two ways to see it. So you can see that the radiation that's created that's going to become this attosecond pulse, the radiation that's created is has an amplitude and phase given by the amplitude and phase of the recollision of the electron as translated through the transition moment of the atom as it goes back down. Okay, uh, I want to make, as I end up this part, and I'm going to almost end and only go a couple more, and I'm coming back to your point, I think, the next one. A couple of things just to make this now practical. The pulse I showed you in the first was only one cycle. You can't make a one cycle pulse that stops anywhere like I did. You need some real pulse. Mostly in many laboratories, we have a multi cycle pulse. This is not realistic either, but you can imagine the pulse. What happens in that case? The wave function, a piece of it ionizes, creating a wave packet, comes back, recombines, giving you an attosecond pulse. This happens the next time and the next time because the wave function can be multiply divided. So we create a train of attosecond pulses, one followed by another, followed by another, followed by another, each separated by half a period of the laser light a frequency, a set of pulses, one after the other, separated by half a period, is a <coughs> set of frequencies. And so if you look at that as a spectrograph, this is a set of frequencies. These are, these are called the high harmonics, high harmonics of the laser light, and the harmonic number can go, in many experiments, from 1 eV, approximately, to 100 eV, so 100 harmonics. And in experiments done in the infrared, you probably hear about from Margaret Renee. Tomorrow, you can go down up to 3,000. I think it is 3,000 harmonics. Infrared driver going to kill them. So this is the process of high harmonic generation. At a second, pulses, almost the same thing. Okay, so now I come back to the what I'm going to say. So of course, I've talked about one atom. And I've talked about a laser beam coming in, so let's make it realistic. Here's a real setup. Lasers out here, all complexity is in the laser. If you want to make an out of second pulse, you've got to do something to the laser. The beam is focused into a jet of atoms, or a cell of atoms, or a fiber of atoms, or molecules, or in fact even solids it can be in some circumstances. The jets that we use our supersonic jets, because we do a lot of work with molecules, supersonic jets. The beam is expanded into the vacuum. It's approximately 10 to the 18, maybe 10 to the 19 atoms per square centimeter, cubic centimeter. The length of the jets are in the order of a fraction of a millimeter. So that's the number of atoms that we're dealing with. But other people, you'll hear here, use cells, which can be longer. They can be fibers. It's basically a cell or fiber. That it's like a cell. So there are different ways you can do this. These are not just a single atom process. So now, why does every atom work? As you go along, the laser beam sees one atom randomly positioned. It ionizes, electron comes back, makes a wave packet, and now the wave packet and the light propagate along exactly together. They find another atom. The next atom ionizes, electron comes back, recollides, creating a wave packet which is identical to the first, as long as the first propagated with C, phase matching again, 
propagated with C along with the fundamental. Nothing about the atom remains. We took the electron from a wave back from the wave function and we returned the electron back to the same state from which it came. Nothing of the atom remains. Only the, only the light comes out. We don't know if it stayed there. We don't know if it went. The second thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to move a slit through them. This will be like a shaft Hartman sensor. Does everybody know what a shaft Hartman sensor is? Does it, all the students know what a shaft Hartman sensor is? So let's imagine shaft Hartman sensors are um, arrays of micro lenses. If you bring a beam into the lens, so first I'll tell you what, bring it into the lens, normal incidence, you've got to focus. If you bring it at an angle, the focus will move. So let's imagine we bring a beam with a complex phase structure on it. And this micro lens sees this phase structure, the focus is over there. This micro lens sees it plane, the focus is where it should be. This micro lens sees it over there. And so if you look at where all these foci are, you know the structure of the phase across the beam. You can't do that with attoseconds or high harmonics directly because it's a, you have to have frequency resolve. You need, you, you need to be able to, um, you need frequency resolution to do it. Uh, so we do this with a slit. It's the same thing as micro lens. We move it around, so it's like having multiple micro lenses. We move it, and we ask, where is the diffracted radiation pattern on our micro channel plate? And that's what I'm going to show you the results of. I want to show you the actual experiment. So here's the far field. There's our detector. Here's the harmonics that come independently. And here are the harmonic radiation. It's done with the second harmonic focus on me that's diffracted in the plus one direction, and here's the harmonic radiation reflected in the minus one direction. One focused, one defocused, just like it should be. A uh, Fresnel zone plate focuses or defocuses, and it goes either one way or the other. And here I can change the position. I can take the beam from being a converging lens to a diverging lens. In other words, the beam is going out when it hits the jet or it's coming in when it hits the jet. And so you can see that now I have focusing down here and defocusing out here. So my Fresnel lens works, my zone plate lens works. And here, I, here's a full characterization because the shack carbon detector sensor looks at everything. I can reconstruct everything about the distribution that comes. So there are two diffracted beams. We're only looking at the diffracted beams. <coughs> They're measured 25 centimeters away from this, the, the uh, jet, and so you can actually see it project back, so it's approximately 25 centimeters. You can see one beam expands out, it's deflected, one beam is focused. Of course, it has a virtual focus on the other side back here, and here there's a similar, um, similar behavior. So you can build a lens <coughs> into the material, and it's just one of the things. You can manipulate the of our harmonics as they're being created in the general way. Okay, so I think I'm uh, probably at the end. So I want to just uh, give you something to think about. I didn't say. Last time I said go back and calculate. So I want to cover a few things in the next one. I want to go now into applications of this. So first I talked about lasers, measurements, control, and then acceptance and application. So I want to address, is it possible to image orbitals? I'm going to come back to that just in two slides, and that would be my last slide. I want to look at molecular dynamics. <coughs> Many people have brought up to me, you've got this gigantic bandwidth of an second pulse. How can you possibly look, use it to look at anything interesting? Right? It's an interesting question, and it's a good question. I'll show you one way where you can take it from being a disadvantage to being a gigantic advantage, a huge advantage making a coherent spectroscopy of time-dependent motion of a molecule. That's the second thing I'm going to do. And the third thing I want to do is say, we can move some of these ideas into solids. Margaret ended her talk by saying, what happens if we go to higher density material and longer wavelength, and we pretty soon have electrons colliding with some neighbor? Well, a solid, you certainly have an electron colliding with the neighbor. But I'll show you that some of the ideas can move into solids, and it allows you again to do unique things, measure unique things in solids that you cannot otherwise measure. So that's the
the direction. I want to end with two of you graphs, if you don't mind. I can take two more. I, one is just an autocorrelator. You can see the image right there. You, you recognize that this is an autocorrelator. We have a short pulse coming into a beam splitter. We got one of the mirrors on a delay line. The beam is focused into a second harmonic crystal and into a set doubling crystal. I put it up because I wanted to make the statement in the top. We measure the electric field as a function of time with a nonlinear interferometer. Maybe the autocorrelator isn't as good, but if I change that to a spectrometer, I really measure the electric field, amplitude and phase as a function of time with this. I could equally measure the electric field as a function of space, should I wish to. Mostly we don't, but you could. Just the sheer interferometer. Therefore, we must be able to measure wave functions because the recollision is an interferometer. It's an interferometer I can control, just like this interferometer. If I can measure wave elect electric fields, why can't I measure wave functions? So we must be able to measure wave functions, and we must be able to measure the adicetic pulses as they're created. So I want you to think about that. That's the issue. Actually, I'm going to leave it this one. Well, before Friday, that's my next talk, my last one. I want you to think about where you stand on measuring orbitals. I'm sure everyone took a first year chemistry course. One of the first things they tell you when you come across an orbital is that it's intrinsically an unmeasurable thing. It's only a concept, something to help you think about chemistry. It's not real. And you understand why, right? If you think about the electrons in the system, they're interchanging all over the place. There's no electron in the model. So it's an intrinsically unmeasurable system. Or is it? Some argue that orbitals are intrinsically unmeasurable. Some say wave functions are not measurable when they're squared. So where do you stand on this? And I'm going to talk about it. So I want you to think about it before we talk about it. Okay. That's the end. OK. Thank you very much, Paul. We have time for a few questions. I mean, this was a good question. Maybe. Shall we show it? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, I will also address this question in my talk. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> so it would be interesting to see if you have the same answer. <laughs> I thought I was the only one talking. Are you, going okay, to give us, right. are you going to give us the answer before Friday? So are you going to, going to give us the answer before Friday? <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you have something in the back? You had a question. Uh, well, it's not really a question, but suppose you could measure a function with that affect our interpretation of the case? Well, I don't think so. I don't think that's such a... Uh, so you're asking me to answer the question. I don't want to tell you what I, uh, <laughs> I, I, how I uh, Maybe it's implicit in this, how I think it would So maybe even the answer is how, at least the answer I would see is implicit in the question. Because not everybody asks me several questions. Let's say it's not the same. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I guess my other question would be a bit philosophical but important. If you do something that a large part of the community believes is undoable. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, I, let's just say you do it. In other words, how do you, right, then, then those people will assume that there's another explanation, right? So I guess the other question would be, is, are there always two, for anything that you actually do, right, that you, any measurement that you would make, would there always be two plausible explanations or two plausible ways for thinking about it. And then it would seem to me that the community would be divided into people that would say it's doable and it's not doable, but they wouldn't disagree on the result of the experiment. Do you agree with that? <laughs> I, I, I assume that people would not disagree with the result of the experiment, yes. I, I don't, I will uh, hesitate to enter into an interpretation until Friday. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, I uh, I free them from thinking about it over the next two days, right, or over the next day. Um, I, I mean, you should think about this. This is an interesting issue. But I, I agree with you that there you have to think about what the explanations are. The experiment is clearly real, I think. I mean, maybe you'll find an error, but I don't think so. 
the experiment that I'm going to describe is real. The interpretation is interpretation. It would be most interesting if the two of you have different answers. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to present a different technique than Paul will present. I'm going to be talking about electron diffraction. Yeah. No, but the question, okay. Oh, this, this is not an article, that's just the structure. Electron diffraction is not clear. Well, we'll see. Okay, okay. The scientific process is not being right always. I mean, we'd be out of business if we were always right. So the scientific process is, by definition, yeah. having competing yeah. measurement techniques, having competing interpretations, and muddling our way to the somewhat better yeah. understanding. You, know, like, you, know, you, you find something unexpected, and then you try to figure exactly. out what's right. going on, yes, and that's exactly. how science advances. Yeah. It's much more messy than undergrad. I, mean, I, I look at it. I agree with that. We discovered, <laughs> we learned to understand ideal physics, new nonlinearity in a sense. Learned to manipulate it under some circumstances. There are broader circumstances which we cannot, but under some circumstances we have. And so there, we should look for those things that we can do uniquely now with this new nonlinear physics that we could not do before. And so this is potentially one. I'm going to tell you potentially something new in solid state physics at the end of my talk. That's how it ends. And, uh, but I think intellectually I will stay within this whole idea of extreme nonlinear optics that I have used as the three, you know, the three lectures. Maybe that's a good. No, you have something. There, there will be another surprise on Friday, too. <laughs> Snow. Snow? <laughs> You're kidding. No. Yes. Stop no, but, but, but you know, if it's like snow, we fire. No. <laughs> I, I almost sent them back to the because there's no snow, snow in Ottawa. Right. Right. I thought there's no chance I'm going to get snow in Arizona. This is desert. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've had actually snow at the school in past years. Right. But, but it's not kind of Boston snow. <laughs> I, I noticed you didn't say this when you Speak. It's kind of a mother layer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So five minutes or so to get organized. <laughs>